started this morning. Um, we to stay on time to go to the path like a little bit later. So tomorrow, uh, this, this morning, we are very pleased to have with us one of our distinguished colleagues in the region. Dr. Wayne Call, uh, Corey is an epidemiologist, a medical geneticist, and a public health specialist in the areas of genetics and genomics. He's been at the CDC since 1986, serving in various roles there in epidemiology, birth defects, and genetic disease. Um, he's currently the director of the public of the Office of Public Health Genomics at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And in addition to that, he's the acting associate director of the um, Epidemiology and Genetics Research Program in the Cancer Control and Population Science Division of the National Cancer Center in Bethesda. He holds a medical degree, a doctoral degree in epidemiology, and he's board certified in medical genetics. He's deeply interested in the public health impact of research and translation of genetics and, and genomics information. And he's published extensively and taught in areas of genetics, genetics disease, genetics, and public health. He's currently on the board of several very large national and international collaborative efforts in the areas of genomic research and the impact of public, on public health uh, in translating that genomic information to clinical practice. And today he's going to speak to us, and hopefully as the fog literally lifts outside, some of it will mentally lift inside. Um, uh, well, Dr. Corey talked to us about the scientific foundation of personal genomics, which has been changed slightly. <laughs> I'll let him tell you that. Good morning. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate the invitation. And I'm going to put my launch here close by. <coughs> so, um, so today I'm going to talk about a subject that's very close to uh, uh, my life over the last two to three years, I've been uh, labeled variously by different companies out there as a naysayer or a, somebody who's uh, trying to slow down the, the progress of genomics and I'm uh, hoping to convince you otherwise. Uh, this talk is heavily uh, uh, influenced by a talk I recently gave in Boston at the third annual consumer genomics. So this is where uh, all the, um, the companies clustered and lots of consumer interest in uh, the first two items on, on this outline are fairly mundane, and I'll go through them very quickly since this is a uh, genetics audience. I'll focus mostly on the last two, which is uh, sort of how do we use, uh, what's the scientific foundation for using our genome, essentially, um, uh, to improve our health, to risk assessment and disease prevention. And then I'll wind up giving you um, recommendations of an NIH CDC workshop that I shared a couple of years ago, which, uh, by the way, the recommendations still hold today, and most of them have not been implemented yet. So we are in the uh, era of genomics, and uh, this <coughs> NHGRI uh, just released their uh, strategic plan for the next 10 years. It's published in Nature, uh, with a steady progress from the bench to the bedside, and everything is becoming cheaper and cheaper and technology more and more powerful over time. This is from the NHGRI strategic plan that shows how uh, their view of the progression from understanding the structure of, of and the biology of the genomes all the way to uh, improving the effectiveness of healthcare of trajectory over time. Now, uh, they're now projecting things beyond 2020. Now, I remind you that uh, Francis Collins about maybe 10 or 15 years ago, predict, predicted that by the year 2010, we'll have it all worked out. And I think the uh, prediction hasn't uh, uh, been essentially fulfilled because it's much more complicated <coughs> to implement something in practice. So what do we do with our genome? And this is the genome of Craig Venter, published online. Uh, I, on purpose, I put it in a very small font here so that you cannot read the alphabet. So maybe he can read his own genome. Um, and uh, as the technology is becoming cheaper, obviously uh, uh, the model is not of the genome. And actually, one of the companies told me recently uh, that they're willing to offer whole genome sequence for free as long as people uh, 
subscribe to the interpretation of the genome because the interpretation has much more will be much more expensive uh, than the, uh, the measurement of the genome itself and uh, will change over time because of as we age we get exposed to so many um, you know diseases and uh, have to take so many drugs that the interpretation will, will change but in the meantime what has happened over the last couple of years or actually more than that is that um, um, there's been a uh, sort of a, uh, I guess, an emergence of a movement that's uh, driven by companies, but also driven by consumer demand, where people want to have their own genome. And this is not full genome sequencing, but we're talking about uh, a few hundred thousand variants to the GWAS platforms. Uh, uh, this is a picture of a split party, I guess, uh, uh, when people, uh, I don't know which company is this, but um, you send in a saliva, you get to print out, and I uh, just wanted to read to you this quote from Kerry Stephenson, who many of you know from Eco Genetics. And he's a scientist, so uh, I mean, he, he's in it not just uh, to make money, but obviously to discover genes and use that information in medicine. Uh, he is convinced that within five years, every college educated person in America is going to have a profile like this. You cannot afford not having this. And uh, while you know, this was 2008, so 2013 is a couple of years from now, but uh, the question I have, if this information is so good, why just limit it to only college-educated people? Uh, why not have it to the whole population? I mean, the, to me, this uh, issue of disparity is, uh, is, is very clear here. I mean, with, this is not like buying a 3D TV set uh, for, uh, you know, the more money you have, the more you can afford to buy more expensive toys. This is good for health. We should all have it. And that's where I, that's my only response to carry here. Um, okay, so I want to leave you on a very quick uh, fact of genomics and human disease. This is obviously a, an audience that knows very well what I'm talking about. Um, the problem in, in uh, the direct to consumer movement is that we are taking the concepts of Mendelian genetics and putting them uh, in, in, in in situations where the diseases we're trying to predict are so much more complicated, and, and you all know that. Um, and being diseases are very collectively very common. <coughs> However, most uh, other diseases, which is about 95% of uh, the diseases we, we get to our life, are much more complicated. And uh, they, they, we have both combination of genetic and environmental risk factors, and, and now epigenetic and post-genomic modification, which uh, actually May even eclipse the, the role of uh, genetic uh, uh, radiation itself. Um, and we have been looking for needles and haystacks literally over the last few years through GWAS and, and others trying to find, and we have found many, many hits for uh, common complex diseases. And uh, some of them have dozens of hits you know, for many cancers, for heart disease, for diabetes, but they still don't account for must, much of the variation and, and those diseases in the human populations. Why? Because it's complex. And more genes to be discovered, and it's gene environment interaction. And what we've been getting from these geoassets for the last few years are what I call complex or weak associations. If you use epidemiologic concepts to develop the risks, we have, um, you know, they're measured in terms of false ratios. And most of these individual variants really uh, don't increase or de decrease the risk by much. 1.2, 1.3, and these are uh, the more significant difference. So if you take the concept of Mendelian disorders, where if you have the genotype, you're essentially doomed, or maybe a lower penetrance for some diseases, and if you don't have it, there's some background risk. Uh, and now we're entering this uh, arena of trying to predict complex diseases where uh, the essentially having the, the variant uh, or not, confers very slight differences in risks. And these are three variants for type 2 diabetes that can be described. So how do we use that information in our health? I'd love to use it. I've been approached by so many groups to test my genome. And I know many of you may, may have done uh, your profiles with uh, one of these three or four companies. Um, I'm sort of resisting the temptation yet, uh, because I think some of the information is unreliable and could be harmful. I'll tell you why. So, and I think this, people have been wondering about this, are we there yet? And this was a couple of uh, 
articles and the New England Journal of Medicine, there is some debate out there saying, well, the reason why we want to find gene is because we want to eliminate biological pathways and find new drugs and therapeutics. The other is the other can is because we want to do genetic prediction. And, and uh, my friend Peter Kraft from Harvard said in that this article uh, that you know should the perfect be the enemy of the good and uh, some of um, my friends from uh, these companies always ask me, so why not? I mean, we, we have all these gene variants, so why not offer them to people? And so this is one argument, you know, why not begin test testing for common genetic variants whose association with susceptibility to disease have been established? That's a very valid question. Okay, so if you do that, this is what you get. So this is an article published last year, um, five individuals, uh, and they're tested by two different companies, and you don't even need to know what the, who, the, who the companies are. Uh, the, and this is sort of the results in terms of increased or decreased uh, um, risk of these diseases by one of these companies. The areas in, in uh, gray and blue are concordance between the two companies, and the white is discordant. So for example, female A was given a lower than average risk Crohn's disease by company A and then above average risk of Crohn's disease by company B, and so on and so forth. So at least half of the cells on this table are uh, discrepant between two companies. Last year, uh, there was a hearing in the House um, by an undercover investigation by the GAO of four different companies, and this is what was presented at that hearing. So there were essentially five different people who have undergone uh, testing for whole genome profiles by phone companies, and uh, basically uh, they, uh, you know, like donor number one, she's a 37 year old female, but she also gave her uh, specimen twice, the second time disguised as a 68 year old female African American. Mm -hmm. And basically, I just wanted to let you know, uh, and this, this, this is just a smattering, all of this is on the website, by the way, of the uh, investigation. So this first person was tested for leukemia for four, by four companies, and uh, one of them said above average, the second said below average, the third said average, and the fourth did not test for susceptibility to leukemia. Something wrong in this picture. It can be above, below, and average at the same time, and so on and so forth. Now, these people are doing their best to do the measurements. So what, what is this? Is this analytical error? Is this uh, interpretation error? Is this incomplete information? all of the above. So um, there is a way to evaluate genetic information for improving health. And we at the CDC have been uh, working on this for so many years, not only just for the recreation of direct-to-consumer, but for, for also legitimate testing and, and practice. And we adopted the, this ACE model that looks at multiple components of uh, genetic evaluation, at the analytic performance, clinical validity, clinical utility, and the other issues. And depending on where you are in your, uh, uh, in practice, if you're a laboratory and you tend to focus on the analytic performance of, of these assays, if you're a public health or a social person, you focus on the assay issues. But really, uh, we all look at different parts of the elephant. We need to look at the whole elephant. So the analytic performance is very simple. Uh, are the assays telling you what, what exists out there? And, uh, you know, and you can measure it in terms of sensitivity, specificity, and then the, the performance of these assays. Now, uh, most of these assays, at least the GWAS ones, are pretty good. Uh, they've been automatized. Now, whole genome sequencing, we're not there yet. I think that the sensitivity <coughs> of that may be around 88 to 92 percent or 93, but that's not good enough for whole genome sequence. But for the GWAS platforms, I think uh, we're okay. But there could be errors in, uh, you know, pre-analytic and post-analytic errors. But that's not what I want to focus on today. Assume, I'm assuming that the analytic validity is good, but some people may disagree. I want to focus mostly on uh, items two and three, the clinical validity and the clinical utility of the information. So the clinical validity is what does the test tell us in terms of uh, disease risk, whether it exists now or in the future. And the clinical utility is, so what do we do about this information? So how can we use, use it to balance the benefits uh, and harms associated with the use of this information? The LC, of course, is the overarching umbrella of how do you use that information in an ethical, legal, and social concept, context. And I'm not going to talk about that in this talk today. So the EGAP working group, which we, we 
sponsor at the CDC is an independent panel that's been sort of evaluating genomic technologies as they come in. They uh, published a series of papers, including the methods paper last year, or the year before now. And depending on the intended use of the test, you can have definitions of clinical validity and utility. For the purpose of direct-to-consumer personal genomics, we're essentially screening asymptomatic people for risk assessment or uh, you know, uh, future risk of disease. So the clinical validity is about the association of the marker with the disease, and whereas the clinical utility is what, what happens after that. So that, let me give you some examples. So there are some steps for evaluation of clinical validity. And the first one is obviously establishing a credible genetic association uh, and these measurements of relative risk. The second step is going from the credibility of genetic association to measuring the risk estimate for the person and how uncertain that would be in terms of absolute risk because you know, a relative risk of 1.3 doesn't tell you anything. I mean, you want to know what's my risk as I go through our life and getting that disease. And then evaluating the clinical relevance of these associations in terms of sensitivity, specificity, predictive value. And I want to give you some examples. So in the early days, uh, I would say up to 2007, this is when we evaluated the existing uh, scientific foundation of genomic profiles. And we looked at seven companies whose names, uh, most of them don't even exist now. Uh, they have been selling 56 genes, 32 of them uh, with 160 variants. Basically, uh, most of them did not have appropriate meta or cumulative analysis. What people used to do in the old days, they would look at a published genetic association and say, that's it, I'm going to put it in a profile. The problem with genetics is that in the candidate gene era, most of these associations were, did not replicate. And uh, you know, one day you have it, and the next day somebody else publishes a paper that says we don't have it. And of the 60 ones, that out of the 160 for which meta-analysis were done, only 60 of them were significant, you know, with an odds, cumulative odds ratio more than one. So, and most of these are weak associations. So in the olden days, even the credibility of the association itself was at, uh, uh, could be questioned. But in the GWAS era, it has changed. So let's move on. So uh, in the second bin here, uh, I want to show you that the measures of absolute risk for a person vary widely in the sense that, you know, depending on the epidemiology of the disease you're looking at, you know, there are trends over time, incidence, elite frequency, the age at which you undergo the testing, the presence or absence of other risk factors. So when, when I see results that says you're above or below average, I say, what average? And does that average apply to me? There's no such thing as an average risk in the population because nobody is average. And there's a second problem, the problem of hidden heritability. I'll show you some numbers. Uh, that after you look at this and you say, no wonder the companies get it all over the place. It's not their fault. It's because, it, uh, because of all these factors and how you interpret it. So if you take a look at uh, uh, breast cancer, very common disease, uh, this is the cumulative incidence over time. Take uh, this group of uh, conditions, and it varies by obviously age, gender, race, ethnicity, and other risk factors. And that's uh, and this is another group, and it varies over geographical areas as well. So in some areas, the risk of breast cancer over time is about two to three times lower or higher than another area. So here are two clusters. So you take a genetic variant, and whether you have it or not, the green versus the purple. Because of the, the bandwidth of uh, weak relative risk of 1.3 or 1.4, it still clusters around the average for that population. So whether you have the variant or not, you know, your risk doesn't vary. You know, it varies you know, from 15% cumulative risk down to 13 or 12%. But if you come from another population, the risk band is completely different. So you can be above average for that population based on the genetic variant, but way below the average for another population if you happen to be of that population that has these other characteristics or you know, different ethnicity, different geography, different other factors of contribution. So when you're comparing, you take the odds ratios from the literature and you apply them to the population at large, they don't mean anything because you could come from different population subsets. The problem of heritability is really even worse. And I'll tell you why. So if you take this analysis done by Peter Scott, published a couple of years ago, and I'll show you sort of uh, two uh, panels here. One, uh, in 
basically took uh, three types of subjects. Uh, people who are in blue, people who are one third of the median risk of the disease in the population, and the people in red are subjects with triple me uh, the median risk, so really a very wide spectrum. And the first panel is when you have 200 yet to be discovered risk alleles, and the second panel that says if you still have 400 yet to be discovered alleles because of this uh, hidden heritability. So if you take the, the people in red here, and uh, this is your median risk, about 7% of the people who are at triple the median risk are classified under a below average, 7%. This is the area here. But if you have more genes to be discovered, that 7% becomes 15%. So again, I would say no wonder. You know, we, we can't interpret that stuff because we don't know the epidemiology of the disease. We have, we have faulty relative risks. We have hidden heritability. We have other risk factors. We have a combination of gene and and we have this phenomenon, which is very interesting, too. I'll, I'll show it to you. And this is data from the Rotterdam study. They've been doing uh, prospective studies of uh, uh, sort of onset of type 2 diabetes in high-risk people. And they, at the time they did this analysis, they had 18 polymorphisms for type 2 diabetes. And they did this modeling, whereby they said, OK, we're going to start adding in the model the most important uh, genetic risk factors one at a time. So if you took, take a look at these dots, say, OK, now for one person, uh, we've added the gene number one. So that person is at the above average risk. But look what happens here is that as you added more genes, it's being dipped below the risk. And all of a sudden, you're back up above the, uh, the average risk. So when you're, at, uh, when, the sun, when you're above the average risk, you have to do something, obviously. And uh, if you're at uh, average risk, that's the same person you're moving all the time, depending on uh, which genes you measure in that person. So this is fairly common. It happens in about 30% of the subjects uh, based on their data. It's about uh, 3,500 people who've been followed over time for onset of type 2 diabetes. Again, the science is moving. Clinical validity is not there. Now, even if it is, let's look at other measurements. Let's look at measurements of sensitivity and specificity. So there is a concept called the area under the curve that many people in the lab use for uh, distinguishing you know, uh, sick people from not based on lab assays. So if you take a look at uh, very strong uh, risk factors, uh, genes for prostate cancer and diabetes, and you count the number of alleles, you increase your risk. But the area under the curve here for sensitivity versus specificity doesn't move beyond the 50-50 sort of random. Uh, chance. Why? Because of most of these alleles, very few people have nine alleles, very few people have zero. So it doesn't discriminate between people who will get sick and people who will not. And the reason why is because you have low relative risks. So it really takes a very large relative risks um, uh, at the extremes to make that distinguishing between people who will get sick and people who will not. And if you apply that concept across various diseases, which uh, my friend Steve Jansen from Netherlands recently did for colorectal cancer, for diabetes, for heart disease, you can see that uh, this, although you have strong uh, associations and they're credible and they're applicable, but the distributions between sick and non-sick people is, is so smushed together that it hardly discriminates between that one and the other. So I think that alone, all of that stuff alone should give you some pause about the um, the, uh, the uh, Validity, clinical validity measures. But how about clinical utility? So clinical utility, as my friends from companies say, it's in the eye of the beholder. We've all grown up in the field of Mendelian genetics where we impart information and people decide what to do with it. This is sort of the traditional uh, genetic counseling paradigm. But this is sort of practice of medicine now in the context of using <coughs> biomarkers to predict disease in the future. Forget that there's genetics. So should we be able to measure what people do with this information? So last year, I had this uh, nice debate with uh, our friends in Decode, Carrie and uh, uh, I guess uh, Jeff Gosher. Uh, we were asked to uh, take the counterpoint, and they, they you know, they, uh, you know, it's a nice uh, couple of papers. And the bottom line, I think we both agree, we all agree that we need data. We need to know what people do with this information and whether it causes more harm than good or more good than harm. And we don't have that data yet. So uh, earlier this year, the Navigenics group and uh, uh, Eric Topol in uh, 
Scripps Institute published this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that begins to fill in some of the data gaps, but not exactly the right kind of data, in my opinion. So they followed people who got the Navigenics platform, lots of people over time, and I uh, will spare you the details here, but you can take a look at the paper just to see what, what happened to people after they got the information. They found no significant differences in anxiety measures. They found no uh, differences in uh, post baseline and follow-up in terms of either anxiety or uh, anything, dietary fat intake exercise. There was a relationship between the uh, test-related distress as correlation with what they people were told about average estimated lifetime risk among the assessed conditions, but 90% had no, uh, uh, essentially no test related distress. But it, it, it's a negative study in, in the sense that there wasn't, uh, you know, people didn't become overly anxious, people didn't do anything with the information. So I, I guess you can take this as a, any way you want. Uh, it doesn't prove validity or utility, it just proves that people um, don't or too anxious with this kind of information, but they don't do anything with it. Now, I want to show you some real example case studies. Uh, and I'm looking at my watch here. Because I think with case studies, we, we know what, you know, intuitively we can do with this information. I'm picking a pharmacogenomics example first. I know this is not an ETC uh, issue, but it could be because you get your pharmacogenomic profiles along with other things to predict future risk of disease. Let's take the most commonly used uh, uh, drug in cardiology these days, which is an antiplatelet agent, clopidogrel, uh, that decreases, you know, used in people with acute coronary syndrome to uh, decrease the risk of your MI and, and bleeding. And we have a genetic pharmacogenomic variant in the CYP2C9 variant that essentially uh, the drug needs activation uh, metabolism in order to do its plated aggregation. And the ultra metabolizers do their, their job much more efficiently than the poor metabolizers. The problem is, so when you see the, the indices of aggregations, they're in the right direction, <coughs> get through, uh, no stent thrombosis, whereas with the uh, uh, poor metabolizers, you get the thrombosis. The problem is the bleeding. You get much more bleeding in, in this group versus this group. So what's the ban balance of benefits and harm? If you use, a, if you use pharmacogenomic testing before you give the drug, and we don't know. And there's a lot of debate about this. And I think the uh, American Cardiothoracic uh, Foundation, AHA, did the uh, uh, clinical guidelines last year, said, OK, clinical validity is there. Clinicians must be aware that there is an association between CYP2C9 and the pharmacology of the drug. But has clinical utility been established that the evidence base is not insufficient to recommend either routine testing or plated function testing at the present time. How can we establish clinical utility? Why not a simple clinical trial? People disagree with me all the time. I mean, it, it's a clinical trial that can be done within a year because the outcomes are very quick. And uh, it's highly promising. Uh, you have to establish because, you know, there is balance of benefits and harm. People get bleeding or, or thrombosis. So uh, which one, uh, you know, predominates? And only by experimentation will know the difference between the two. As a result, I mean, if you take a look at the FDA website these days, there is more than 70 drug gene, gene pair that have been labeled by the FDA. I would say most of them, if not all, we have evidence of clinical validity, but not clinical utility. I mean, uh, there are some exceptions, like uh, HLA and abacavir testing for uh, uh, some of the uh, side effects of abacavir uh, for HIV treatment, uh, and so on. But we, we can discuss that if you want. Let's take case study number two. This is sort of more in the domain of uh, 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 ETC. And this is a real case. Uh, this is a person who has been going around giving his uh, anecdote. Uh, some of you may know him. Uh, I won't mention his name. He's a 48-year-old white male in good health. Father had localized prostate cancer at 68. Concerned, he got tested using the decode prostate cancer genetic test. Then his relative risk for prostate was 1.88. Now, mind you, it's, um, the lifetime risk of prostate cancer is somewhere around 5 to 10 percent in men. And some people say, well, if, you, if all men live long enough, we're all going to get prostate cancer. But let's say 5 percent risk, so that gets you to about maybe 9 percent risk. So he was concerned, obviously. He wanted to take action. He did a PSA test. The PSA test was still within normal limit. It 
was a tool. Uh, but he was even more concerned. He went to a neurologist. He had a biopsy and the out with a prostate cancer diagnosis. And as a result, he underwent radical prostatectomy with her stand. So that's one case study. All right. On the other hand, you have people like Dr. Oz, who's been uh, uh, actually, this is true, he went on the Oprah Winfrey show before he got his own show. He took the same test, and he found that his relative risk is he's about 30% less likely than the average man of developing prostate cancer. So 5% lifetime risk, he's at four. Okay, now he was reassured. He said, oh, I don't have to do anything. I don't have to have uh, digital rectal exams. So 1.8, you know, 0.7. I mean, if we do this on a sort of a population-wide basis, and that's sort of what my public health had on, what will happen? Will we have, have will we save a lot of people, or will we, we cause anxiety, or inappropriate, you know, sort of uh, even worse? And so this is based on lots of uh, small uh, genes with small effects. And if you happen to have four or five of them, you can have a 1.88 relative risk. Now, prostate cancer screening is still a debatable issue, even with PSA. Every time I go for my annual checkup, I have to debate with my internist whether, I mean, he wants to give me the PSA automatically, and I would say, no, I don't want to have it. But it showed up. It always shows up on my results. And uh, I'd say, I didn't ask for it. I said, well, I'm tracking you over time. I want to know whether the PSA increases or not. But if you apply the PSA, I mean, so there are randomized clinical trials. Some of them are debated, and it's basically the controversy that reduces the dye, because some people find it, some people don't find it. And the problem with um, prostate cancer screening is that, uh, as I said, many people get prostate cancer, but they don't die from it. We haven't found the right biomarker that essentially tells you that you, you have that aggressive uh, prostate cancer that needs management. And, the, and the, the other problem, and this is a modeling exercise that was done by Karen Howard and her group, that um, she did some estimations about uh, essentially side effects. And they are in the double digits of, of all kinds of things like impotence, uh, urinary incontinence, all kinds of things. And maybe it varies by surgeon or, uh, and so on. That there, is, there is a lot of side effects that go along with prostate cancer screening. Now, the anecdotes one and two, I mean, the, uh, you know, they, they, I mean, basically that 48-year-old man who I see every now and then keeps telling me, this uh, deco test saved my life. And I haven't talked to Dr. Oz. Uh, I hope he's still reassured. But, you know, I, can, I can't, you know, you cannot make public health policy on the basis of these numbers and the data that we have, both on clinical validity and clinical utility. They're both weak at this point in time. And some people may disagree with me. I say type, type 2 diabetes, the most sort of the, uh, I guess, the epidemic of the 21st century. And there are lots of gene variants associated with type 2 diabetes. This is a smattering of them from Jim Max. Um, and they're not bad. They predict. So if you construct genotypic scores, your risk of diabetes score goes up, depending on the score. So about 25% of the population have a lower genotypic risk score, 11%. Those, if you take a look, though, even though you have now lots of uh, genes, the, again, the, uh, the distribution, the overlap is still there. So the area under the curve, even with all of them combined, is still not, not there. And take a look at this. Your family history still uh, predominates, even with all the genes that we are measuring. In other words, family history, with or without the genes, and maybe that's your hidden heritability, or maybe that's your shared environment between family history uh, is, still, uh, is still king. So family history and your BMI are actually the most predictive, uh, two most important uh, tools for predicting type 2 diabetes in the future. And they're pretty good. So a simple clinical model can actually achieve a very high uh, performance in terms of prediction, about 90% area under the curve. You add the genes to it, you improve one in a thousand. So it's really not that much uh, improved prediction by adding the genes to it. So again, clinical validity is not there. How about clinical utility? And clinical utility is very important because people would say, well, uh, if you know your genetic risk profiles, maybe you'll be more motivated, maybe you will, uh, you know, you can uh, do exercise and, and so on and so forth. And here's some data from the diabetes prevention program. This is a randomized clinical trial that's been in the works for many, many years. And 
they randomize high-risk people into placebo usual care, metformin therapy, and life, uh, heavy lifestyle intervention. And this has been published over and over again that lifestyle intervention and metformin works. So for people at high risk of type 2 diabetes, you need to do lifestyle plus or minus metformin. Now, people have gone back to their freezers and started uh, stratifying their data based on the genetics of the individual. So in this case, the TCF7 uh, L2 variant, the most, uh, one of the most strongest risk factors. So you have three genotypes among the, the randomized groups. The high risk genotype PT among the placebo, you know, it has a relative risk of about 1.4. So you can see that within each group, the, the genotype uh, has a high risk regardless of the intervention. But take a look at this. So if you are high risk, metformin works, lifestyle works. If you are low risk, metformin works, <laughs> lifestyle works. So maybe it works a little bit more if you are high risk. How do you interpret this data? Lifestyle works, metformin works, regardless of genotype. So should, do we need a genotype before we recommend lifestyle and metformin? I would say not. We don't have a very strong predictor like PKU, uh, and maybe, maybe when you put all the genes together, maybe we'll get there one day, but we're not there yet. Okay, the last case study is uh, uh, profiling to assess risk for cardiovascular health, and this is a, uh, a uh, review that the EGAT working groups uh, published last December based on an evidence review, and as well, uh, this is the evidence review, and this is the recommendation. The EGAT working group, as I said, is an ind independent panel that has been uh, regularly reviewing the evidence, and I want to share with you what they found. So the rationale for testing for uh, 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 sort of susceptibility to cardiovascular disease, we have Framingham risk scores, we know what to do in, in heart disease, but people are saying that, well, we could have some reclassification of risks, even though the relative risks are very low, like you take the 9 uh, P21, uh, variant that has a relative risk of about 1.5, that sometimes you're depending on your threshold of risk, you might push people for from medium risk to high risk so that uh, you start basically statin therapy earlier uh, because of the risk of disease. And uh, I've published a little bit on this because this reclassification is a fraught with difficulty. Here. Reclassification works both ways. You can push people from here to here and here to here but it presupposes that you have to have a good uh, spread first with a good area under the curve before you apply it because otherwise you can end up with a lot of errors and we can discuss that. But what happened here is that the, uh, the EGAP working group reviewed about uh, all these panels. There were 29 genes, some with multiple variants, the outcomes, heart disease, and stroke. And they, these are uh, the, the companies at the time that offered the risks. And this is the uh, distribution of the uh, for heart disease. Uh, about 28 variants, odds ratios for 38 of them. The credibility of the association was found to be only strong in one of them, that's the 9P21, and the rest uh, not credible based on epidemiologic criteria. The highest odds ratio was about 1.5, and the lowest was about 1.26. And on the basis of that, again, they did this, the traditional risk uh, spread analysis, uh, again, showing even with 28 variants that there is uh, still quite a bit of overlap in the inability to predict one way or another. And as a result of that, they found insufficient evidence to recommend testing for the 9P21 or other 57 other variants in 28 genes to assess risk for cardiovascular disease in the general population, specifically heart disease and stroke. And they found the magnitude of the net health benefit from use of any of these tests alone or in combination is negligible. Therefore, they're discouraging the clinical use until further evidence supports improved clinical outcomes. Now, you get all these genes based, uh, I mean, if you do the PTC testing, they're telling you, okay, you're at increased risk or decreased risk of heart disease uh, based on, on these numbers alone. So I want to close with, um, uh, you know, this is a backdrop that we took to a, uh, a, a panel, a workshop uh, that I convened at uh, both CDC and NIH uh, published two years ago. Uh, and one of, you know, you probably can't see the list of names here, but the four companies were there. So was Carrie Stephenson, so was uh, Francis Collins. You know, anybody who uh, has a stake in the, the personal genomics field. And by the way, um, 
Jim Evans, uh, the editor of Genetics and Medicine, tells me that this is one of the most highly cited, uh, actually the second most highly cited article in, in the journal over the last 10 years. So uh, I guess people are reading this literature. So we, we, the, con the panel convened December 2008, uh, long before you know, some of the new findings were there, but we went over some basic scientific principles. Much of them I already discussed with you, but they were discussed at the workshop as well. And we ended up with five recommendations. I want to tell you what they are. I think uh, most of them still hold uh, as of today. So the first one is the obvious one, which is an industry-wide scientific standard for personal genomics. You know, you, you know, the GAO undercover investigation really uncovered a lot of uh, the lack of standards. And right now, uh, you know, up to that point, there was little oversight or regulation by the FDA. You know, the FDA is flexing their muscles over the last year or two uh, to try to regulate this direct to consumer movement because it, to me it's not the right thing that you know you, you know you, it's, you have one genome and four different companies giving you four different results that that shouldn't fly so even if, before you establish validity or utility you need to establish the performance of these assays and and the, the quality of the testing as well as as uh, uh, scientific standards so that's that's the first thing that needs to happen still work in progress on the trade. The second one, which I think is the bulk of uh, the recommendation here, is that what we need is a multidisciplinary research agenda, not only you know, in gene discovery and functional assays and all of these good things, but on uh, the clinical and the population side. A lot of epidemiology is obviously needed. We're just scratching the surface of the genetic associations and what they need. Behavioral <coughs> research is obviously very much needed of the kind that, uh, that the Navigenics paper uh, did earlier this year. I have a few other examples uh, I could have given you, but uh, uh, we're running out of time. How to communicate this information. We obviously need clinical studies and maybe RCTs for some sub-segments of, of, of this information, especially the ones where treatment and interventions have to follow, like with clopidogrel, etc. We need to perform economic analyses about cost-effectiveness. We need to explore the LC issues, outcomes, and public health surveillance, which uh, we've been doing a lot at CDC. We've been tracking sort of the utilization of uh, these practices over time and how you know providers are informed and as well as consumers are informed. I'm all for consumer uh, awareness. I'm all for consumer empowerment, actually. And maybe uh, at some point we could use our genome as, as uh, sort of teachable moments to do the right things and uh, that are sort of outside the scope of the genome as well. And what we need to do, and these are recommendations three and four that came out of the meeting, is essentially enhance a credible knowledge synthesis and dissemination of information to providers and consumers because this is an alphabet soup right now. And while consumers need to be empowered, but consumers can be confused as well because they, they, don't, they don't know where to go. I mean, if the company is telling them, this is your data, this is your information, why should they believe the company for which they get tested from? Uh, because if you go test, get tested by another one, uh, you know, you, you need that credibility, you need an honest broker role, and they, then you need to link that knowledge synthesis with evidence-based recommendations for use, and that's where professional societies and groups like EGAP can come in, and because that, uh, that essentially is, is giving more of a stamp of a rubber stamp of a sort of good practice and, and showing evidence and utility. So we need education information and EGAP type process, but not necessarily that, but an evaluation uh, um, of, uh, of the kind that I showed you earlier. And uh, finally, um, I think people at the workshop uh, were very strongly feeling that this is a new dawn here, that this is, this is a new arena, a new time that uh, we need to explore the personal utility of the, of the genome. And um, as my friend Jim Evans keeps telling me, you know, astrology, science, and personal utility. So does that mean we all, you know, you can pay for, for whatever you want, and we're not trying to stop that from happening. But in order for personal utility to be credible, you need to measure, you have to have metrics of personal utility. In the scope of medical genetics, there is a lot of personal and social utility, even with uh, higher penetrance genetic variants or for which there is no treatment, even like Huntington and others, people do all kinds of, I mean, there's diagnostic odysseys, there's all kinds of things you can measure. Uh, whereas in, you know, in the realm of common complex diseases, those metrics of personal utilities have not um, been done, and it's a wide open field right now. 
So I think I want to uh, end up with the, the so-called the scientific bottom line of personal genomics in 2011, um, not before you leave. That's it. So I ended up with three minutes to spare. Thank you very much. <laughs> Like the diagnosis of unknown 
of genetic diseases and on syndromes, maybe in cancer genetics. And ma many of the presentations I heard during that time and workshop, uh, you know, sort of reinforces that concept in me. It's just that I don't think, personally, I don't think whole genome analysis is ready for the masses yet. Uh, but um, I think what's happening is that the pressures of uh, the declining costs and the, um, uh, the insistence on return on investment by uh, private sector is, is moving the business model in that direction. And uh, people will say, well, it's cheap. It's going to be you know, under $100. I can afford it. Um, so yeah, and the genomics is not alone. I mean, that's how, how where we are in the US based on technology. We are a country that cherishes uh, you know, technologies and and whether it's um, you know whole total body scans and X-rays or uh, the latest uh, gizmos and whatever, we, we like that stuff. And some cynics might say, well, that's why our healthcare system is broken. But uh, I'm not going to go there. Uh, but I do believe in the power of genomics. Uh, I think it's. Um, I just don't think we're quite ready yet for having everybody's genome done. Uh, and I think I believe in simple messages like no family history. And if you have a uh, you know, in the leading conditions of your family, by all by all means, go explore it and, um, and see what's uh, what's in it for you. Yes, I, I always like to bring up the concept of future genomics. You know, you talk about examples of pharma genomics. So, um, had I had heard, and I don't know if it's true, are they considering the new RDAs and DRIs? <laughs> Uh, based on human genome, do you know if that's being discussed at NIH, or and, and is that something that we talk about? Oh, it's been talked about a lot. I mean, nutrigenomics um, is is very hot right now in, in the research circles, um, and not only from the point of view of genetic variation, but the point of view of epigenetics and uh, all these good things uh, as well. If you think pharmacogenomics is complicated. Nutrigenomics is at least 100 times more complicated. What drives, you know the drug you're taking, because you get prescribed and you can measure it, you know the pharmacology. Uh, in nutrition, the problem is, unless it's, you know, you're taking a, a sort of a low phenyl alanine diet to treat PKU, you know, it's sort of three floating populations. Uh, measuring nutritional variables is a very complex task. And uh, let me take a simple uh, example like folic acid. Um, you know, we at CDC we kind of added this around a lot for the prevention of mineral tooth defects and <clears throat> even heart disease and so on. And there are genes like the MTHFR and a few other folate related genes that actually, you know, modulate your response to folic acid. And uh, the last time we looked at it uh, from an RDA like perspective, they, the answer was no, there's no need to change the RDA based on MTHFR or other related genes. It's just like you know, you have clinical validity, but not clinical utility. You have associations, but that those associations are not strong enough to warrant action. And uh, that could change over time. And I, I really, I mean, I, I you know, uh, I think that, you know, if I give this talk 10 years from now, it could be a very different talk. But right now, we're not there yet. All right. I think, I think we're going to have to stop at this point. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was a great talk. And look forward to